morning. Welcome to Peninsula Baptist Church Online. Um, It's good to be here with you today. I've been looking forward to singing and and praising with you this week. And before we get started, I wanted to read this, uh, this verse to you. It's Psalm 40, verse 16, and it says, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation, may they continually say, Great is the Lord. We're going to sing the song, How Great Is Our God, and I just want you to, uh, to praise him for, for his salvation. Let's do it. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, always oh, see how great. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end, the God the three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God, sing with me. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations, and Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you 
find me All my fears and failures Compel my life again Give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender And say that you're doing well and we're delighted that you've decided to join us this morning. I'm Cindy Lamy and I'm Robert. Welcome to Peninsula Baptist Church Online. Let's pray as we continue in worship this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord we thank you. You are mighty to save us Lord and we're grateful. God we uh, we're also grateful for just the chance to be gathering like this. I know it's different. Um, we're in different places, maybe watching at different times, Lord, but um, God, we're still giving you the glory and we still want to honor you. I pray that as we keep singing and, and learning about you from your word, that we can be encouraged um, by joining together as, as believers this morning. Amen.
uphill I will follow, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning Hey, thanks for joining us today. If this is your first time, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Peninsula Baptist Church. We are online here every Sunday at 9 and 11. We also have a drive-in service at our south parking lot in Ocean Park uh, at 11 o'clock every Sunday where the weather allows us to do that. So uh, again, thanks for joining us. Today we're gonna be in Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. If you wanna turn there, again, that's Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. So recently, a friend of mine asked me a question that he had been pondering. He asked me what heaven was going to be like. Now, I love good questions, and this was a great question. Good questions drive us to learn, and they drive us to grow as people. And this question was no exception to that rule. And so my friend and I and the people who were around us, we we ended up having a great discussion about eternal life, what eternal life is going to be like, and what is important in eternal life. And I just walked away from that conversation blessed. And today, we're going to be talking about that same concept, eternal life. We know that all of us someday will leave this earth and begin eternal life. Now, uh, there's this certain hope that all of us have that Jesus is returning, and so some of us may not even see death to experience that eternal life, but, but many of us very well may. And so we want to be aware of eternal life and we want to be prepared for eternal life. So in other words, I just don't, don't wanna just know about eternal life. I also wanna be prepared for it. But how can we be prepared for heaven? Is there something that we need to do to be prepared for heaven? Well, the answer is yes, and I think the answer may surprise you. And today, Jesus is going to share that answer with you about what it looks like to be prepared for eternal life. Now, before we talk about this concept, though, I want to reflect for a moment about this topic. So the topic of eternal life was a huge theme in Jesus' teaching. Part of what Jesus came to do was to teach us about eternity. Let's check out what John sa- Jesus says in John chapter 12. In John 12, verses 49 through 50, Jesus says this, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me. He himself has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And so Jesus is telling us that the things that he shares, the lessons that he teaches publicly, the lessons he teaches privately to his disciples, even the conversations that he seems to be having casually, all of these things are designed to reveal to us eternal life. And they are the will of the Father that he would say them and speak them. He's not just saying them because he wants to. Our Father in heaven, or God in heaven, the one who ordained all creation to exist, our very existence itself, he wants for us to know the truth that Jesus is teaching us about eternal life, and it is the mission that Jesus came for. Now in this, there's also this double entendre where Jesus is saying, and I know that his command is eternal life. He's saying that the words that I'm sharing with you, they have the capacity to give you eternal life, but he's also saying that the obedience of these commands, obedience to them themselves is eternal life. So these commands are revealing eternity to you. And if you're following these commands, then you're receiving eternity. It's an amazing thing to think about. And it also gives Jesus' teaching for us today a huge level of authority. It's not just a casual conversation. It's literally that heaven has opened up and that God is delivering to you truth about eternity that he wants you to know because he loves you. 
Now, as we study what Jesus says about eternity, we realize that there's more than one aspect. Now, there's one aspect that I'm gonna talk about first that we as Christians love talking about and we're really actually good at talking about it. We love talking about the gift of eternal life. So we love talking about the fact that eternity or eternal life is a gift. And like I said, that's a good thing to talk about. The Bible talks about this gift a ton. Romans 3.23 says this, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul in Romans talks about the gift of eternal life. John tells us that Jesus talks about the gift of eternal life in John 3.16. He says, Uh, that God gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so John is highlighting that God is a gift. When you read 1 Peter, you realize that Peter tells us about the gift of salvation and that God has purchased us with the precious blood of his son and that we have received the gift of an imperishable seed, a seed that makes us alive forever. So all of the disciples knew that eternal life was a gift and God deeply wants us to know that he is offering us the gift of salvation. This is why in John chapter six, as Jesus is talking to his disciples and the crowd around him, he says to them, most assuredly I say to you, in other words, this is definite truth. He who believes in me has eternal life. And that means that salvation or eternal life with God in heaven is a gift and that anyone who believes in Jesus has that gift of eternal life. I love that. That is one of my favorite truths to think about and share with others. Since the moment my children were born, I started praying that they would discover the gift of eternal life and fall in love with Jesus in the way I had because I knew how good it was. I wanted them to experience the same thing. And yet there's another aspect of salvation or another aspect of eternal life, and that is the reward. Now when I first learned about the reward of eternal life, I was shocked. I experienced intellectual and spiritual disequilibrium, which means I was kind of like dizzy intellectually and spiritually. I didn't like the truth and I resisted it. I know it sounds strange to resist truth from God's word, but I had been believing a myth about eternal life, but I was convinced that it was the truth. I discovered something very surprising to me, and that was that Contrary to my own personal beliefs before this, we are not going to all experience absolute equality and congruence in heaven. Meaning this, while we will all experience the same reality in heaven, the life we live in that reality will be varied and different based on our conduct on this earth. Now to me, when I heard about that, that statement sounded wrong and crazy. Jesus came to pay for eternal life for all of us. How could it be different for any of us? We're all going to go to heaven and live in joy and have peace and goodness forevermore. And that is certainly true, and yet there is so much more to eternity than that. And so I had to learn a new truth, and it was difficult, and it was challenging. Now, I know that might be shocking, but I want you to think for a second that there are many myths about eternal life, even among Christians. For instance, I have heard Christians say things like, well, now that they've gone to heaven, God just has another angel. Or when I go to heaven, I can't wait to be in God's angel chorus. Now, I can tell you that if you read the whole Bible, study it intently, you will never find that it says that any human who goes to heaven will become an angel, and it's because we can't. We are humans. We are physical and spiritual beings, and angels are a different type of being, and they are just a spiritual being, so we will never become an angel. I have also heard people say things like, when we go to heaven, it's just gonna be one giant, awesome worship concert for forever. 
Well, certainly there will be singing and praising God in heaven and we will live to his glory forevermore. And yet at the same time, we will have holy and awesome work to do in heaven in the new heavens and the new earth. We will be administrators of God's goodness on the world at that point in time. And so there will be work to do and it will be fruitful and we will love doing that work. And so we'll do way more than just singing. Now to me, that's good news. I love singing, but I love doing other things about singing. So, so we are constantly in this process of replacing what we believe to be true with the absolute truth of God's word. Now, I don't want you to just take my word for this, this concept of rewards in heaven. I want you to know that this truth is from God. And so we're gonna look at God's word together right now and look at the secrets of eternity that Jesus is revealing to us. But before that, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you sent your son to reveal eternity to us. Right now, we are intently turning our hearts and our minds towards you. We want to receive the truth of Jesus from your word. And so we pray, Father, that you would teach us well today. I ask God that you would use my words to open up the scriptures in a way that are memorable and effective in our lives. I thank you, God, that you teach us so well and that you know the truth that we need and you guide us into it over time. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 12 today and we're gonna be starting in verse 41. So I'm gonna read a short section of that out loud. Verse 41 says this, Lord, Peter asked, why are you telling this, par- or pardon me, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager whom his master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. But truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and starts to beat the male servants and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on the day that he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. All right, let's stop for there for just a minute. So Peter asks Jesus the question, Jesus, this parable that you just told, is that for us, your disciples, or is it for everyone around us who is hearing this? You have to remember that Jesus is teaching his disciples in the midst of a crowd. So Jesus' teachings are amazing, and his miracles are astoundingly awesome. So word about him has gone around to the whole area that he is in, and many people are following him, and yet he is on a mission to train his disciples. So Peter's asking a really wise question. Jesus, you just told us that that you're gonna come back like a thief in the night and you want us to be prepared for that. So are you telling that to me and these 11 other guys? Or are you telling us that because you want everyone to know that? And so Jesus answers in the form of another parable. But Jesus' answer doesn't seem to focus on the who is being addressed, which is what Peter's asking. Instead, he is talking about what will happen. And he says this, the ready servant receives a reward. So there's this parable and there's a servant and a master again, and the servant who is ready receives a reward. The servant who is prepared for the master to come home, that is. Now, I wanna pause for a minute and just point out a wordplay that's happening in the text that we might not pick up on naturally. So the word for master is the same word for Lord. And so as we read, it it says in verse 42, the Lord, referring to Jesus, so Luke is calling Jesus God, replies, and then in 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 the message that Jesus shares, the parable, he says that there's a master, and it's the same word that refers to Jesus, it's kurios, which means Lord. So when the disciples were hearing this for the first time, they were learning that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God himself walking in the flesh. 
But Luke and the person he was writing this book to, Theophilus, when they read that, they would have seen very quickly that Jesus in this parable is referring to something that will happen with him, that he himself will come back and he will reward people who are serving him faithfully. And so when they're reading this, they're automatically thinking Jesus is coming back, which is just a wonderful example of how good a teacher that Jesus is. Now I want you to pause for a minute and imagine this happening to you that Jesus could be looking down at the way you are living your life on this earth to serve him and he would look at you and say, wow, you are blessed because you are faithfully serving me and I have a reward which is great for you. Doesn't that sound awesome? I love thinking about the fact that my life can please God in such a way that he would seek to reward me. And God wants you to also be interested in this concept of receiving a heavenly reward. Now, many of us know that we have salvation. But I wanna ask you this. Are you really prepared for eternity? Do you understand there are two aspects of eternity? the gift of eternity and the rewards that are available to you in eternity. Many believers, when they find out the gift of eternity, they just say that's wonderful and then that's all that they have and they don't realize that they have this incredible opportunity on this earth to store up for themselves treasures in heaven. But Jesus wants you to be prepared for eternity and so he wants you to know that how you live on earth, what you do with your time here before you enter into eternity, can and does directly impact your quality of life in eternity. I wanna repeat that because it's such a huge concept. What you do on earth, the way that you serve Jesus, how you use the opportunities of your life, can and does impact the quality of life that you will have in eternity. Now there's a simple phrase that I wanna share with you today that will help you remember this. It will pay to obey. It will pay to obey. So eternal life is going to be awesome. Everyone who is in heaven will experience bliss and joy and peace and love forevermore. In Revelation, it says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that everything old, everything that doesn't belong in eternity will be taken away and it will pass away and we will only have the newness that God desires for us. That is going to be incredible. And yet at the same time, Jesus wants us to know that there are more things in store for us than just that it can get even more awesome than you already imagine it to be. And so Jesus tells us to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy or eat nor thieves steal. It's this treasure that is permanently there for you that will never go away. And so we are able to receive rewards that will fill those who get the rewards without this world excitement. Think about this, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake, for your reward in heaven will be great and you will rejoice greatly when you receive it. What? Why, why would I rejoice when I am receiving persecution on earth? Well, whatever I suffer on earth is nothing compared to the glory of the reward that God has for me when I have endured that for his name's sake. And so whatever the cost here, it will be paid back in such great ways that you will be overjoyed to have suffered what you suffered on earth. Now think about what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Peter was crucified and he was crucified upside down because he did not count himself to be worthy to be crucified in the same way as his savior his Lord who he loved. And so he received a great reward because he was persecuted. James, the brother of Jesus, was beheaded in Jerusalem or stoned to death. We're not sure with, but either way, he was murdered for his faith. Paul was executed for his faith over and over again. First century disciples were martyred because of their faith and they counted it joy. The first century disciples marched into the Colosseums to be beaten by gladiators or mauled by lions and they marched in singing hymns of praise to God because they were counting on this great reward. They were overjoyed at what God was promising them on the other side of that suffering. 
And so Jesus is telling us, keep the reward in mind. I have great things in store for you, he says. Now this might be a challenging thing for you. You may have not previously understood this idea just as I hadn't previously. And I want you to remember that this is Jesus' teaching, that I'm not making this up, that God stepped out of heaven to reveal this truth of eternal life to you. I wanna go back to the text. Remember, Peter asked this question, Who is this for? Well, we need to understand who the manager is if we're going to understand who this text is for. So who is the manager? Now, many people look at this and they would say the person who is the manager is actually the one who's responsible for feeding other servants in God's kingdom. Now, that's pastors and teachers. And you know what? It fits very well on our shoulders. But when we think about this in a broader context, we realize that in the kingdom of God, everyone who has salvation is a manager. You see, when you have salvation, one of the things that's true for your life is that everything that is in your life is a gift from God. And the good and the bad alike, he wants to use for your good, the purposes that he desires in your, to accomplish in your life because you love him. And so we see that everything that we have in life is a gift from God. And beyond that, we see that we've all received many things to manage. We have our intellectual capacities. We have the strength of our bodies. We have time. We have relationships. We have gifts. We have talents. We have opportunities. We have received the gift of eternal life. The very love of God has been poured out in our hearts, and we are responsible to manage those gifts well. Did you know, for instance, that if you live for another decade from today, 10 years from now, you will have received the gift of another 87,600 hours How are you going to use those hours? Certainly you need to sleep and you need to eat and you need to care for yourself, but what are you gonna do with the rest of your time? That is a lot of time when you think about it. If you were to just spend an hour a day over that time, that's literally just serving others and and seeking to bless others, that's thousands of hours that you will have used to the glory of God. What is your reward if you use those hours well? Or what about the relationships and opportunities that you have? Think about this, maybe you're a neighbor a brother, a sister, a child, a parent, a husband, or a wife. In all of these things, God has given you the blessing of a relationship and a role within that relationship, and if you use that role, that blessing well, to serve and love the other person, to lead them to know God and glorify God, then you are going to receive a great reward for that. I mean, think about this. In Ephesians 5, Paul instructs fathers to raise their children in the discipline and knowledge of God. And so as a father, my role is to teach my children and discipline them in such a way that through my loving fathering, they would know God more. Wow, so I am a manager of the relationship with my child And if I manage that relationship well, it will have eternal fruit in my child's life. Additionally, I'm a husband. God has specific callings in my life as a husband. He tells me that I am supposed to love my wife as Christ loves the church, laying himself down for her. That means that personally, God says that my relationship with my wife is to be used in such a way that I would lift her up, treat her as more important than myself, and lead her to know more and more of the goodness of God. I'm supposed to help her know the Father through the way that I love her. And when I do that well, I will receive a reward for this. And over and over again, Jesus leads us to truth in the word about how he sets up our lives to glorify him and that as we do so, we are pleasing him and it will pay for us to obey him. As a summary of this concept, let's look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 23 and 24, Paul writes, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So everything we do in this life as a follower of Jesus can be done for him. And when it is, we will receive a reward. It will pay to obey. 
Now let's look at what's next in the text. Jesus has just described this beautiful moment in the life of the servant and, and in, in eternity where he comes back and he finds those who are faithful to him, those who are serving well and ready for him to return. He calls them blessed and he promotes them. He gives them a great reward, sharing everything he has with them. But then he starts to describe a darker and harder picture. Let's look again at verses 45 and 46. He says, but if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying in his coming and starts to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on that day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know and he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. Wow, that's very hard and very dark. Well, Jesus is teaching us that just as it will pay to obey, it will not pay to disobey. It won't pay to disobey. But this section still really sounds rough. Now, if you're like me, when you read this section, your eyes go right to the part where it says that the Lord Jesus will cut him into pieces, and then after that, he will assign him a portion or a place with the unbelievers. Now, right away I think, man, I am not into that. And it is culturally offensive to us to to think about someone being cut into pieces because of being an unfaithful steward, even if they're doing the heinous things that this servant is doing. But we need to avoid the judgment that comes from looking with our culture on the biblical culture. Remember that these these are just cultural values and Jesus is using the situation in life that he's in to help his disciples to understand what it is to follow him. And so we need to throw off our judgment of a different culture and we need to lean in for deeper understanding. So let's take a moment and look what is really happening here. Well, when we really look and think about what's happening in the text, our initial gut reaction is correct. I don't like what's being described and I don't want that to happen in my life. I don't want Jesus to come back and find me disobeying him in such a way that I would anger him and receive discipline or punishment from him. But then we also have to ask some important questions. What is it to be cut to pieces? And what is it to be assigned a place with the unbelievers? And then we need to imagine, or not imagine, remember the immediate context. Jesus is teaching his disciples, but he's also teaching this whole crowd. And part of that crowd are Pharisees and Sadducees who are opposing the teachings of Jesus and rejecting him, which means that they are risking eternity separated from God and that the position that they've been given in Israel would be abused and they would enter into the very thing that Jesus is warning them against. And so Jesus isn't just teaching his disciples, he's teaching people who are hard-hearted and he's hoping to win some to salvation. And you know what he does? Some Pharisees and Sadducees start turning towards Jesus and then finally when the disciples are ministering in Acts, many turn to Jesus during that time. But beyond that, these questions aren't fully answered. So let's dig into the Bible so that we can understand more deeply. So when it's hard to understand something in the Bible, it's important to look at a wider view of the Bible and allow the truth of God's word to inform us on the things that are hard for us to understand. And so let's do that today in order to understand this. So we're asking the question, would God take someone who has received the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ and judge them based on their conduct in such a way that would cause them to lose their salvation so that he's cutting them up and casting them into hell with unbelievers? Well, honestly, some people, respected teachers of the Bible, would say yes, that if you renounce your salvation, if you no longer faithfully serve Christ, that you will lose that salvation and you will go to hell. But there are others who say, no, there's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation. Well, let's look at the Bible to figure out which of these two ideas is true. So if you turn in your Bible to Romans 8, which I will do really quickly here, if you turn your Bible to Romans 8, you start reading right away in Romans 8.1. Paul writes this, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So in other words, sin and death have no effect on you any longer. No matter what sin you commit, you will always no longer be condemned. You are free from condemnation. That's good news. 
Paul begins to build on this and by the end of Romans 8, he says, I am convinced that there is nothing can, that can separate me from the love of God. Not height nor depth, so in other words, no place I can go on earth will separate me from the love of God. Not man, not created being, so not an angel, not a spiritual force, not Satan himself, and no human, no matter what they do from you, to you can separate you from the love of God. And he even says, not even sin can separate you from the love of God. Wow. So if the love of God is not able to be removed from me, that probably means that I have salvation forever. But there are some teachers who would say, well sure, God still loves you, he's really sorry that he has to put you in hell, but you've turned away from Jesus and so you've lost your salvation. Well there are still other places in the New Testament that show us that this isn't possibly true. If you turn a little bit further in Romans to Romans chapter 11, verse 29, I want to share the truth that Paul writes there. He says, God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. They cannot be removed from you. Remember just a few minutes ago, we were talking about how salvation is a gift from God. Well, if it is a gift, something that God gives from you, God says that's irrevocable. I will never take my gifts and calling back from you. And so you are sure and secure in your salvation, which means that this verse can't be about casting someone into hell or eternal punishment. It must be something else because the salvation that God gives you, he does not take back. So he's not saying that. What is he saying? Well, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for a little bit more clarification. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you will. So I'm going to flip there myself. Now, this context is going to use this term, use a term which is actually from the Corinthians, or not from the Corinthians, from the Olympics. So if you look at 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul writes this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we will answer as believers before God about the good and evil that we've done before our lives. Now this judgment seat is called the Bema seat and it is a reference to the Greek Olympics. And so it was the, the judge of the winners. It's not a judge that's looking for condemnation. It's a judge that's looking to give you a reward. And they're looking at your conduct in the Olympics and they're gonna determine what you receive as someone who has competed in the Olympics. So if you have gotten in to the first, second, or third place in our modern day Olympics, then you would stand and you would receive a reward, a medal for what you have done. But if you didn't, then you received no reward. Well, if we understand this context on the the chapter that we're reading today and we think about what's there and we study the words a little bit more closely, what we'll realize is that the text isn't actually saying that it will cut you to pieces. It's actually saying you will be cut in two and so you will be separated from your reward So you, as a believer of Jesus, will enter into eternity, but you will not receive the reward that you could have received if you were a faithful servant who was ready. That also means that you will receive the part or the inheritance of an unbeliever, which means you will receive no reward. So if you don't place in the race, it's just like you didn't race at all. You don't receive anything for running because you ran in vain. You didn't run in a way that is worthwhile which, by the way, is faintly reminiscent of how Paul talks about his own life. He says, I have run the race and I haven't run the race in vain. I have finished the course well. And that's Jesus' wish for each of us, that we would receive this just and heavenly reward. But if we don't finish well, there is a reward, or there is no reward. So now that we've gotten that out of the way and the piece of the text that is hard for us to understand is explained, let's engage in what Jesus actually wants us to learn from this text because his disciples wouldn't have had that issue. Let's learn from the bad manager. Observe the character of the manager. How does the text describe him? It says that he first tells himself that the master is gone and won't be returning for a long time. So the manager becomes self-informed. Rather than receiving instructions from God, he turns to himself for answers. And then he becomes self-aggrandized. He makes himself bigger in his position than God has actually made him. And so he becomes violent. And violence is always prideful. And so this prideful man starts to beat the male and female slaves. 
So for us, this is incredibly wicked to think about, actually striking someone who's under you, who you were supposed to be supervising. And it would have been also rough in this culture. Um, A man shouldn't be beating a woman like this. In most cultures, it's not okay. There are some that it is, but in Jesus' culture, it wouldn't have been okay. And so everyone who's listening is like, whoa, this guy is going off the rails. And then it says, he is eating and he is drinking to the point that he is drunk. So if you think about the story, he's taking the blessings that God has given them and instead of using them to care for other people, he's only taking care of himself and he's doing it to excess. So he's taking all the gifts of God and saying they are all for me and what I want. And so he is prideful and he is greedy. He is filled with self-love. He's saying I am more important than everyone else and I should get what I deserve. He has become completely egocentric. Now, if you remember, one of the things that Jesus has told his disciples that is that anyone who wants to follow after him must deny himself daily and must pick up his cross and put himself to death every day. And so Jesus is telling us we have to put our egos to death daily. But here, this man, who's a negative example of a disciple, he is being alive to himself every day, and he's being dead to the master, to Jesus every day. Now let's look at what happens to this bad manager. He loses his potential reward. The the master comes, the Lord comes, and he surprises this unfaithful steward and he separates from him from his reward and gives him the reward of an unfaith or an unbeliever an unfaithful steward and so he's really casting him out from his reward now this is a harsh picture but beyond that he says that he will receive discipline let's check out what Jesus says he says in verse 47 and that servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself to do it will be severely beaten but the one who did not know and did what deserved punishment will receive a light beating. Wow. Now that that doesn't sound very good to me, and it, it wouldn't have sounded very good to the disciples. Severe beatings from the Lord if there's disobedience, and if it's willful disobedience, it's especially severe. And if it's ignorant disobedience, well, it's still beatings, which feel very severe to us. But if you think about what we know about entering into heaven, we're already aware that this is coming. In 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul talks about how we can build on the foundation with Jesus things that are either of earth or things that are of heaven. He calls the things of earth wood, hay, and stubble. And he says, but if we build with heavenly things, we build with gold and silver and precious stones. And then before we enter into heaven, we will be purified or cleansed through fire. And everything that is of this earth in us will be stripped away and everything that is of heaven will stay with us. But some of us, some of us will not have been faithful and everything in our lives will be gone. And we will enter eternity as one who goes through fire. Now that's not an easy thing to lose everything that you built up in your life and realize that all of the things that you counted as good, God doesn't count as good. That is painful. It is a moment of severe discipline. Fire is severity and it strips everything away that is not worthy of heaven in our lives. But again, this doesn't mean that you're rejected as a child of God. It just means that you're missing out on the reward that you could have had if you had served well. But if we think about this, We actually want this. We want this wicked servant to receive justice. We want him to be punished for beating others when they didn't deserve it. We don't like that he's a wicked man, and so we're comfortable with God punishing him. But what gives me pause personally is that I don't want discipline like this in my own life. I want justice for other people when they're bad, but I want grace for myself. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you're driving down the road and somebody whizzes by you driving way too fast and you just think, man, that person's driving crazy. What a jerk. And then just a mile later, you see a cop has pulled them over and you're just thinking, I hope they get what they deserve. And yet I'm guessing when you get pulled over by a police officer, you're hoping that you might get off with a warning. See, we want justice for other people who are clearly doing the wrong thing, but we don't always want it for ourselves. God doesn't want us to receive that sort of justice either. He wants us to receive just rewards for faithfulness. So within the passage, Jesus is providing three motivations for serving well. 
First of all, he wants us to think of the reward. He says that I am coming back ready to reward you, ready to promote you in heaven, to give you a place of significance and prominence in my eternal kingdom. But he's also providing the motivation of fear. I don't want to be disciplined by God, either before eternity or now. And so I work hard to please him because I would rather have a reward than a negative consequence or discipline. But then Jesus provides a third motivation, and that's the motivation of love. I love God, and I want the world to know that I love God. Because I've received salvation in Jesus Christ, I know that God is amazingly loving and good, and I, I am just blown away by him. There is nothing that is better or more beautiful than him, than him in all of eternity, and he has given me himself that I might know him. And so as a result, there's a lot that I can do in my life because of what he's given me. If you look at the last verse in our text for today, Jesus says this. He says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. God has given me much, and I love him because of what he has given me. But I also know that because I love him, because he's given me so much, that great things will be expected of me. God has poured his Holy Spirit out on all those who believe. He has given them gifts which can build up eternity, which can bless other people, that can heal them externally and internally of the things going on in their lives, that can build up his kingdom here on earth, and he wants us to use them nobly as members of his royal family, as kings and queens on this earth to bless others, and we are accountable to him to use those gifts well. Now, I started this message, and I talked about the importance of being asked good questions. So I want to ask you two questions today as we close out our time together. First of all, why would God allow you into heaven? This is the first part of understanding eternity. Well, God only allows those people into heaven who have received the gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus. There is nothing that you have to do to earn this gift of salvation. It is given to you freely, and all you have to do is accept it. And so if you can say, honestly, God will allow me into heaven because he's given me the gift of eternal life through his son, then you know that you have this assurance of salvation. But I want to ask you a second question, and that question is this. What rewards have you stored up for yourself in heaven? What have you done on earth for which God cannot wait to reward you because of your faithfulness to him, because of the excellent job you have done with the gifts and calling that he has given you? Think back to when we were talking about what some of those gifts were. God has given you spiritual gifts. He's given you natural talents. And more importantly, he's given you opportunities and relationships and time in which to use those gifts. How are you putting these things together to build up his kingdom? How are you putting these things together to love others so that they would know and experience the love of God? Jesus is watching, and he's not watching to judge you or condemn you. He's watching because he cannot wait to come with his reward for you to announce over you, wow, you are so blessed. I have a great reward for you because of your faithfulness. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and he cannot wait to lavish his love on you by giving you these eternal rewards. Jesus says at the end of Revelation 22, 12, or the end of Revelation in verse 12 of chapter 22, behold, I am coming soon and my reward, my repayment for those who have served me well is with me to repay each person according to his work. You and I will stand before God and we will be rewarded for the good work that we have done for him on earth. Jesus is coming with his reward. He cannot wait to celebrate the work that you have done as his disciple. It will pay for you to obey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth from eternity or truth about eternity from Jesus. I just love the way that he clarifies what it is to know you and follow you. I know that I want to be a faithful disciple and many of those who are listening today also want to be faithful disciples. 
Help us to remember, Father, that it will pay when we obey you, that you have given us opportunities and general callings in our lives, and when we fulfill those, you will reward us that you have given us specific opportunities, divine appointments, moments with people that you have called us to, to lay down our own lives, to love them well. Help us to be faithful to you, Father, because we love you, because we want to receive your great reward, because we want to see your name glorified for all eternity. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, won't you stick around to sing a final song with us? And please remember, you are are loved. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them and ceaseless praise. Take my hand and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. You guys are loved. Hope to see you next week.